So how do we understand baptism in the context of salvation history? To understand baptism in this context and in, in God's plan of, for salvation, it's important to go back to creation to see that from the beginning, the way that God creates is from the waters and the way that God saves his people throughout the Old Testament is by passing through the waters. So in the beginning, we read in Genesis that the spirit was moving over the waters and from these waters, God brings forth life. He brings forth the earth and the earth separates the bodies of the waters. Now, we then have the beautiful story of Noah and his family. They are faithful to God, and they build the ark according to his will and his commands. And it is through the waters that sin is washed away from the earth. Noah and his family are saved from sin and brought into a new covenant with God. Now, when the Israelites are unfaithful to the covenant, they fall into slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. Moses then appears as this great salvific figure for the Israelites. He leads the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, and they come to the waters of the Red Sea. They're being pursued by Pharaoh's soldiers, and through the raising of the staff, symbolizing the power of God, the waters part, and it's through the waters that the Israelites pass from slavery into freedom. Now, while free, they wander in the desert for 40 years. Uh, they then make their way to the promised land, the land that was promised to them by God, and it is there where Joshua leads them from the desert into the promised land across the Jordan River. Now, we see this prefigure in the Old Testament uh, of the Israelites receiving salvation by passing through the waters. These stories are fulfilled most especially in Jesus Christ himself. And what he says and what he does and what happens to him, we can learn so much. Everything he does, we can learn from. And so we look to the Gospels. We look to those stories of Christ uh, to not only show us the way, but to see who our Savior was. And so one of the early stories we have from the Gospels is the baptism of our Lord, where Jesus goes to John the Baptist and has John baptize him in the Jordan. Not because Jesus needed baptism, but because we need his help uh, to bring us to salvation. We do things all the time for children, not because we need to do them, but because our children need to see us doing them, and they need help in learning how to do them. In order for our children to understand some things, we physically sometimes have to move them. Uh, God knows our condition. He knows our situation, our fallenness, and so he goes to John. And in order to show us the importance of baptism, he himself is baptized in the Jordan. Immediately after that, Jesus begins his public ministry. This indicates to us now that with baptism comes mission. And we see moving on towards the end of Matthew's Gospel, where, where Jesus tells his apostles exactly how important uh, baptism is. Uh, in God's plan of salvation, baptism is an essential element for all of God's people. In Matthew 28, uh, Jesus has died, he has rose from the dead, and he's about to ascend into heaven. He gives the, some final words to his apostles, and so in Matthew 28, he tells his apostles, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, until the end of the age. Jesus tells his apostles there the importance of baptism. He says, you need to teach, baptize, and don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you always. Now, we see this immediately played out in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Immediately following that, Peter and the apostles go out and they begin to preach the gospel to the people there. Immediately, the people ask, what, we, what must we do? The story goes on to say that Peter and the apostles baptized about 3,000 that day. They go, they preach, and they baptize. This is what Jesus commanded them. Uh, this is what he told them as his last words before he ascended back to the Father. And immediately, this is what Peter does with the other apostles. What we see from this is that God brings about new creation from waters. At the beginning of time, 
and throughout all of salvation history, in particular moments, God chooses to bring his people from slavery and to freedom, from the desert into the promised land, and finally Jesus himself institute that the passing through the waters of baptism, salvation is offered and brings the person from slavery to sin and death due to sin and to victory over sin and new life. We become co-heirs with Christ. And as we pass through the waters of baptism, we are then able to stand with Christ and say together with him, Our Father. So how does God work through the church and specifically through baptism? Now, as we saw in the Old Testament, God chooses to enter into history at specific times to bestow his grace on his people for the sake of salvation. Now, in a similar way, Jesus institutes the sacraments as specific events where God's grace is given to us for the sake of our salvation. So how does the sacrament work? Well, to, to give you a quick definition, it's an outward sign instituted by Christ, entrusted to the church, that gives the grace it signifies. Now, God knows our human condition. We are made of, of matter uh, and of spirit. And so God takes this formula and uses it to accommodate our human condition. He gives us a physical, tangible sign like water. And as he entrusted the sacraments to the church led by the apostles, when the church proclaims the words of Christ, accompanied by the outward sign, grace is bestowed. Now, in the case of baptism, the sign of water symbolizes being washed clean, made anew, cleansed. The sacrament actually brings about what it signifies. The person is really washed from sin, cleansed from original sin, made new in Christ. And they're finally, they're, they're brought into that inner life of the Trinity in whom they were baptized into. It is not just a sign, but it is a sign that brings about a supernatural reality. Now, by entering into this new life in baptism, the person enters into that story of salvation where God chooses to act in time for the salvation of his people. Now, it's important to see that these sacraments are, 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 are God's way of bringing us into his inner life. It's those moments where we are drawn into the mystery of Christ. And from this person, from Jesus Christ, we're able to attain salvation. So how is baptism one of the sacraments of initiation? Now, becoming a part of any group entails taking on some commonalities with the group as a whole. For example, when a child is born, they are named by their parents and they all have a common last name. They live in a common house and share things in common. Now, these are all done informally, of course, but, but to illustrate the point that there are visible signs of unity within a particular group of people. Another example would be a sports team. They all wear the same jerseys. There are these commonalities to distinguish a group of people. Now, for Catholics, these, these signs also produce eternal and supernatural realities. These are the sacraments of initiation, that foundation into that life of Christ. And so the sacraments of initiation are baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. Now, like birth, baptism brings us into that inner life of the Trinity. It brings us into that inner family. It brings us into the inner life of the church. Confirmation strengthens and completes the graces given at baptism. Now, how do we understand this? Well, it's very similar to the way we, we, we understand life. At birth, a child is brought into the inner life of the family. They are brought home and they live that life there. But as we all know, the family does not remain in the home. They go out. They have work, school, other activities outside of the home and away from the other members of the family. Confirmation is that strengthening for life and mission. Actual graces are given at confirmation that help the person live the Catholic faith in love with Jesus Christ. This began at baptism. 
this new life ushered in through baptism, strengthened and completed in confirmation, is a life that needs sustenance. It's a life that needs help. And so, in the final sacrament of initiation, the Eucharist is given as spiritual food to unite us to Christ in the most real way this side of heaven. As we make our way to heaven, we journey with Christ. We journey we f- by following Christ. And so in a very real way, uh, Christ is present with us, most especially in the Eucharist. Uh, what is amazing about the Eucharist is that it's unlike anything else. When we consume any other food, it becomes part of us. But because Christ is present in the Eucharist, when we consume the Eucharist, we become more like Christ. This is the intimate communion that comes through Holy Communion. This is the intimate communion that was begun at, bapti- at baptism, continued at confirmation. And, and, and its high point is reached in the, the, the re- reception of Holy Communion of Jesus Christ himself. So how is baptism celebrated? Now, the essential rite of baptism consists in immersing the candidate in water or pouring water on his head while pronouncing the words of Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Catechism states that it signifies and actually brings about death to sin and entry into new life of the Most Holy Trinity through configuration to the Paschal Mystery of Christ. Now, many old baptismal fonts were, were recessed into the floor of the church. There would be steps leading down uh, to the font, symbolizing that the person is dying with Christ. They would be baptized at the font and then ascend the stairs into the main part of the church, symbolizing not only dying with Christ, but rising with him and entering into his body, the church. The, this, the, the, the whole theology of baptism was built into the architecture of some baptismal fonts. And so, uh, uh, as, as we're brought into that new life of Christ, it's the whole life of Christ. Not just the happy moments, but the whole life. His death and his glorious resurrection. Now, part of the rite of baptism consists also of two anointings with oil. The first anointing is with chrism, symbolizing we are anointed with the Holy Spirit as priest, prophet, and king. Now, these are very important to understand these, these threefold, this threefold mission of Christ. As priests, we're called to offer sacrifice. As prophets, we're called to be witnesses of Christ to the, to the entire world. And as kings, we're first called to rule over ourselves so that we can make a gift of ourselves and to also remember our, 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 our hope and our glory that will hopefully uh, be in heaven. Uh, that we will reign with Christ the King. Now the second anointing is with the oil of catechumens. This oil is symbolized uh, t- uh, as healing and is used to strengthen. This, symboli- this symbolizes being cleansed from original sin and given sanctifying grace. Also part of the rite is the clothing with the white garment. The child literally puts on Christ. They become a son and daughter of God and Christ is their brother. This harkens back to Galatians 3.27 where St. Paul tells us, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Now, there's many different parts uh, to the rite that can can be used. These are some essential parts uh, of, of the full rite of baptism. But what's important to remember that all of these are, are there to draw us into the mystery of Christ. God gives us his grace, but he does not force his grace. We're always called to be disposed, to receive, to say yes to the grace of God. And so the church uses these anointings, these, these extra prayers, these special prayers, uh, to draw us into that mystery of Christ and to dispose us to receive God's grace. Who can receive baptism and who can baptize? This is a pretty obvious answer. Simply put, anyone who is not yet baptized can be baptized. 
Adult baptism has been a common practice since the beginning of the church. The adult catechumen, or the RCIA, which was, which was restored by the Second Vatican Council, is a journey of faith formation, conversion, and preparation for this sacramental initiation. Now, the baptism of infants was also a common practice in the early church. And we read uh, stories uh, in the book of Acts in, in chapters uh, 16 uh, and also in chapter 18 of entire households being baptized. And so anyone and everyone should be baptized. Now, the bishop, the priest, and the deacon are the ordinary ministers of baptism. And in case of an emergency, anyone can baptize. Even the non-baptized can baptize. Now, what's, what's needed here is that the intention required is to will and to do uh, what the church does when she baptizes. Namely, that she baptizes the person into that inner life of the Trinity using that Trinitarian formula. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Now, this is a very important question to answer, uh, not only for us, uh, but for us to be able to explain to others who ask. The Catechism states, The Church does not know of any means other than baptism that assures entry into eternal beatitude. This is why she takes care not to neglect the mission she has received from the Lord to see that all who can be baptized are reborn of water and the Spirit. So how do we understand uh, the necessity of it? Well, let's look at it this way. Christ is the only way to bridge the eternal gap between God and man. Christ is the only way to salvation. Now, this does not mean that we just simply have to follow Christ. We must become one with Him. Baptism, like the word really means, uh, baptism is immersion into Christ. We receive that indelible mark as belonging to Christ. Now, united to Christ, we may enter into heaven and be saved. However, the Catechism states, God has bound salvation to the sacrament of baptism, but he himself is not bound by his sacraments. So, how do we reconcile these two statements? That on the one hand, baptism is necessary, and on the other hand, God is not bound to the sacraments. Remember, the sacrament is the sign that brings about an eternal reality. This reality is immersion into the person of Christ, and that is where salvation comes from. Now, in His love and mercy, God gives us a way to enter into Christ. I mean, we have to, we have to look at it from this foundational point that God says, here, I will give you a way to enter in and to be united to my Son so that you can enter into heaven. However, God is not bound to the sign of baptism. But he is able to bring about the reality, which is this, that salvation through uh, Christ alone. He's able to bring about that reality without the sign. Now, God may immerse the person into Christ outside of this sign, but baptism is the only sure way of entry into Christ. The church is bound to baptism because that was the way that it was given to Christ. That is the way that we enter into Christ. But God uh, uh, is not bound to that sign. God can bring people into his, into his Son without the sign. But in His love and His mercy, God says, I will give you a way. I will give you a way to enter into My Son and to enter into new life. Now, a, a simple analogy will help us understand this further. Say, a person with cancer goes to a doctor for prognosis. The doctor says, yes, it is cancer, but for this type, there is an absolute cure. It is simply to remove the cancer from the organ. The doctor is giving the patient the only known cure, removal of the cancer. Now, is it possible that a miracle may take place and the cancer may miraculously be removed? Sure, but there is no guarantee that a miracle will happen. Like the doctor, the church has a cure. 
Christ has given us a way to salvation. This is baptism. It is a great gift of God to have a sure way to the grace of salvation. Like those in the Old Testament, God has given us an event to bestow the grace of salvation on us. The graces that come from the merits of Jesus Christ himself are given in this gateway to new life. And so it is in baptism that the church uh, preaches and it is in baptism that the church brings people to enter into that new life. And so it is there where we draw our strength. It is there to the waters of baptism that the Christian can go. What are the effects of baptism? So in baptism, we go to the divine physician for healing. We are forgiven of all sins, original and personal. In case of infant baptism, it is simply the washing away of original sin. So not only are we made clean, but we are also given sanctifying grace. This is the life of grace in the Trinity. This is the life of grace uh, in Christ. Now, when this sanctifying grace is placed there for the first time, an indelible spiritual mark is placed on the soul of the person. Baptism seals the Christian as belonging to Christ. Therefore, baptism is not repeated, and somebody cannot be unbaptized. Now, the Catechism states, the baptismal seal enables and commits Christians to serve God by a vital participation in the Holy Liturgy of the Church and to exercise their baptismal priesthood by the witness of holy lives and practical charity. The grace of baptism also incorporates us into Christ's mystical body, the church. Now, it's important to understand that this incorporation into Christ's body is in a very real way. It is not a simple, symbolic gesture. So how do we understand this? To get at the reality of what is taking place, we turn to the words of Christ himself to St. Paul. In the conversion story of Saul in the, books of, in the book of Acts, Saul is knocked to the ground, and he hears a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul simply says, he says, Who are you, Lord? And the voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. However, let's look at the story. Saul is persecuting the Christians. At this point in time, Christ has already died, he has risen, and he has ascended into heaven. He is no longer physically present on earth. So why does Christ tell St. Paul that he is persecuting him? He does not say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute the church? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute the Christians? But he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Christ has intimately united himself to the church. Christ ascends and through the Holy Spirit at Pentecost unites himself to his church to the point of self-identification. Now in baptism, we are brought, we are immersed into this body of Christ, the church. It is full of sinners, yet it is guided by the Holy Spirit and made holy by Christ. As part of this church, we become shares in the common priesthood of all believers, meaning we are called to conform ourselves to Christ and to offer our life as a sacrifice back to Christ. Now, the Catechism gives us a beautiful description of this life. It states, Reborn as sons of God, the baptized must, must profess before men the faith they have received from God through the church and participate in in the apostolic and missionary activity of the people of God. What does baptism have to do with creation, and what is the role of the parent? So the, this question with baptism and creation is really important for parents who are baptizing infants or young children. Now. We easily understand participation with God in creation by bringing a child into this world. But there's a second dimension we must not neglect. Now, God has created everything out of nothing. All of creation is a small reflection of who God is. And so, uh, 
he also holds everything into existence. It is here because of God, and it continues to be here because of God. Pope John Paul II stated in a catechesis on, the, on creation that having created the cosmos, God continues to create it by maintaining it in existence. Conservation is a continuous creation. Now, in a similar way, our participation in creation does not end with bringing the child into the world. The Catechism puts it this way. The fecundity of conjugal love, which simply means the fruit of marital love, cannot be reduced solely to the procreation of children, but must extend to their moral education and their spiritual formation. Now, the church has always held these two things in harmony, this, these aspects of procreation and the education and raising of children, so much that she says that it is the inalienable right of the parents to educate and form their children. So, in the same way that the parent cares for the body, they must also care for the soul. This is how we continue to participate with God in creation. We do many things as parents to keep our children safe and healthy. We, we feed our children healthy food. We give them vegetables. Uh, we, if they're about to stick a fork in an electrical socket, we, we slap their hand out of the way. We do everything we can to keep them safe. In the same way, we must also care for their souls. We must pray with our children. We must pray for our children. We must continue to teach our children the Catholic faith. And we must keep heaven in the forefront of our minds. And we must understand that the state of their souls is more important than their body. The Catholic parent, in this way, cares for the whole person, body and soul. We understand that we must provide these things, food, clothing, shelter, but even more important, we must provide these spiritual gifts to our children. Now, bringing your child to the sacrament of baptism is the most important duty for you as a parent and also for the beautiful life of this child. It is so important that the church calls the family the domestic church. Why? The Catechism puts it this way beautifully. Christ chose to be born and to grow up in the bosom of the holy family of Joseph and Mary. The church is nothing more than the family of God. From the beginning, the core of the church was often constituted by those who had become believers together with all their household. When they were converted, they desired that their whole household should also be saved. The families who, become, who became believers were islands of Christian life in an unbelieving world. And so today, as, as families, as Christian families, we're called to live in this same way. We're called to be those, those believing uh, Christians. We're called to be those islands of Christian life in an unbelieving world. So what is the role of the Godparent? The role of Godparent is built upon the foundation of your sacramental initiation into the church. For this reason, the godparent must meet the following requirements. They must have received baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist because these sacraments form the foundation of the Christian life. Without this foundation, you cannot lead others. They must also be at least 16 years of age. The godparents must be practicing Catholics, which includes Sunday Mass attendance and following the other precepts of the church. Along with this, if they are married, their marriage must be recognized by the church. Again, having been brought into the church, the godparent must not for any reason place themselves outside of Christ's body. Now, why does the church place these requirements on godparents? As we talked about, the role of the parents is of the utmost importance. The child's salvation is on the line. Nobody can fulfill this role alone. And nobody can fulfill this role apart from the grace of God. The role of God, parent, is a participation with God's grace in order to help the parents and the one being baptized to recognize the great gifts God has given us and to help that person respond in selfless love back to God.
the role of godparent must not simply be an honorary role placed on a person, but it is a mission given to a person based on their virtuous witness to Christ that is already present. Now, there are four ways that we can, four very practical ways we can assist parents. First, we can assist them by caring for the child now and in the future to remain with that child as they journey through life. Second, and probably one of the most important, we must pray for the parents, we must pray for the child for their entire life. This is that, that unseen help that we will never know the effects of this side of heaven. We must constantly and always pray for those that are placed in our charge. Third, we can offer spiritual support to both the family and the person. And so it's important for the godparent to take a very active role in the spiritual development of the family and of the person. And so sometimes we may have to ask those hard questions. Are you getting to Mass? How's your prayer life? Are you reading Scripture? And so in that way, we, 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 are, we could be that spiritual rock for the person to help them when they fall down and to praise them and to praise God when they're doing well. And lastly, we can only do this if we first ourselves are holy and we become holy through sacrifice. As parents, you know what it means to, to, to sacrifice. Women, uh, mothers, they literally sacrifice their bodies for the sake of of another person. Husbands, they work hard and, and work to provide for their family. In that way, they, they sacrifice much for the betterment of their family. And so, in a similar way, the godparent is called to also sacrifice, especially for this person. Through this life of sacrifice, which models the life of Christ, we become holy. Through this holiness, we can help others to Christ. We become Christ present here on earth. Now, the greatest way we can understand this is with the, the lives of the saints. Some of the saints, they lived such a sacrificial life, such a holy life, that they were not just Christ-like, but that their physical bodies literally started to look like Christ. St. Francis is a great example. He literally had the stigmata. His physical body began to look like Christ. His holiness sh shined forth through his body. And so, as parents and as godparents, we're called to be saints. And we're called also to lead those that have been placed in our charge to become saints as well. We can only do this together. And so, through, this, through, through the spiritual support, through the prayers, and through this universal call to holiness, we can enter into that inner life with God. And, and in that inner life, we can bring others.